Hello, everyone. Welcome to day two of DrupalCon Portland 24. How's everybody doing? You have a good time last night? Um, I want to make sure everybody knows there's still a lot of seating over here on the left-hand side, and if you've got some empty seats next to you, feel free to raise your hand so that folks can file in and get where they need to. Um, it is my pleasure and my privilege to be introducing today's keynote. Uh, my name is Tim Lennon, or Hestnet on Drupal.org, so a lot of you probably know me under my handle. I am the CTO of the Drupal Association, so I lead the team that builds the tools that we all use to collaborate on Drupal and to create the Drupal project. Um, as a reminder, the Drupal, DrupalCon is an event of the Drupal Association. We're a nonprofit organization serving the global community. We bring you DrupalCon, we bring you Drupal.org, and we support community activities all over the globe. To, yeah, thanks. Today's keynote is Open Source AI Now, Why Open Must Win the AI War. So we're gonna talk about this a little bit more, but I think it's a really interesting topic and an interesting moment in our history. So uh, without spoiling the details of the keynote, I think it represents an opportunity for us as an open source community, as advocates and defenders of the open web, to shape a future that's coming whether we like it or not. And I think that's a really key message that we need to think about as we move through here. Um, but first, a few quick reminders, a little bit of housekeeping like we usually do each morning before the day really kicks off. Again, a reminder of the DrupalCon Code of Conduct. If anyone ever feels unsafe or uncomfortable, please find a member of the association staff or go to the registration desk and we will make sure that you are in a safe place and we can resolve whatever issue. You can find the details of the Code of Conduct on events.drupal.org slash conduct. Another reminder of the photo policy or the media policy in general. We, are, we encourage photography, we'd love for you to share these things, but it is a photos with consent event, which means if you've got a red lanyard in any of your photos, that's someone who did not want to be photographed, so please don't post those, um, red or orange. Um, there uh, are also some additional uh, bands. The blue one is the regular attendee band. The green one means it's someone with some sort of hidden disability who might need a little extra time or encouragement to be able to engage with your group. Just give them some, that space and, uh, and know that they are uh, just as happy to be here. Um, a few events that I want to highlight that are happening today are a few uh, content items. The public board meeting of the Drupal Association will be here in this ballroom starting at 11.30 this afternoon. So if you're interested about the governance of the Drupal Association as a nonprofit entity um, and the strategic investments that it is making, you can certainly join us for that. There is also a first-time contributor workshop happening at two o'clock next door in 204. So the first-time contributor workshop is an opportunity to learn the nuts and bolts of giving back to Drupal. So if you were inspired, for example, by Dries's Starshot initiative, by this pledge to contribute to a greater vision for Drupal, but you don't know where to start, you've never contributed to Drupal before, or maybe not even to open source before, we really encourage you to go to that workshop. There will also be another one tomorrow and contribution throughout the week. If you're not familiar, if you haven't gone to one yet so far this week, there is something called Birds of a Feather Sessions. These are informal, unconference style sessions that are more discussions or roundtables between uh, like-minded folks who have a topic to discuss. So in the G hallway, sort of down the southern side of the convention center, you'll find the sign-up boards for these. Anyone can write in a topic that they'd like to host a conversation with, and you can see what's already up there. Uh, and there's an effort to try and sync those to a calendar as well, so you can keep track of that. Um, and speaking of birds of a feather, I do want to highlight a super boff. Um, so Dries mentioned in his keynote yesterday that he was holding two boffs, one was yesterday afternoon, to discuss the Starshot concept for Drupal, this concept of building an innovative new version of Drupal that innovates at a faster pace and that includes the best of the um, experience that we can create for Drupal end users. So that next boff is also going to be next door in 204 at 3 o'clock today. So why are we talking about artificial intelligence today? Why did we invite an expert in the field to educate us, to give us thought-provoking questions, to talk about this? Um, I think as an open source community, we are naturally skeptical of disruptive technology. Um, I think we have a strong sort of ethical point of view about the way that technology should be used. Uh, as a small personal anecdote, some of you may have seen in the DA booth, my coworkers invited me to 
to promote my book that I published recently. And as an author and a, a writer of fiction, um, I am seeing an industry where 70% of self-published works are now AI-generated schlock, right? And we're seeing where you're competing in a market where um, it could impact our creative careers, it could, could impact our professional careers, and it could impact the reliability of news media and politics. Um, and so it is, uh, it's a very confronting topic uh, for all of us, I think. And so we want to confront these topics. We want to understand the ethics of the situation that we're in because our choice is not, will we live in a future with AI? Our choice is, will we passively accept how that future is defined? Or will we be part of building a future with hopefully a more responsible and more ethical bent to the way that AI impacts our world? So um, I'd like to introduce the sponsor for today's keynote, Josh Koenig from Pantheon, who is then going to introduce our speaker. Thank you very much. At Pantheon, we are proud to partner with Lytics to bring a free tier of their personalization engine to more web teams. Imagine you're on the web team for a fictional nonprofit, the Whisker Network, put together by our friends at Blue State and Accelerant. And you know you will be more effective at fulfilling the mission of your organization, connecting New York's cats to their forever homes, if you can convert more site visitors into email subscribers. And after visitors become email subscribers and click the links in your emails that lead to your website, you don't want to waste web page space asking them to subscribe again to the newsletter they just clicked. No, you would rather show subscribers a message that asks them to donate. This mode of working has eluded too many web teams because it has required a too large upfront investment in connecting a customer data platform to a content management system to a content delivery network. No more. With Pantheon, Lytx, and pre-built Drupal integrations, you can jump over the wheel reinvention and find out if the practice of personalization works for your team. Stop by the Pantheon booth to find out more. Ah, love uh, Steve Persh video, the dramaturg of web ops. Um, I'm privileged to be here for just a moment to introduce uh, our keynote speaker. Uh, and I just want to say my 60 seconds on the topic of AI, AI. It's very difficult to perceive what's real and not when you're in the middle of a hype cycle. Um, I was recently in a kind of a closed door session with a bunch of uh, media publication uh, operators and uh, digital agency folks. And like, the question was, what are you really doing? Um, and candidly, people were still very much in a wait and see mode, but many of them felt pressure. They were being pressured by the hype cycle and their stakeholders to have a story, to have an answer, to have a project. And when you're inside of a hype cycle, it's very important to stay grounded in what's material and what's real and what's practical. And there are absolutely practical benefits to this technology. Um, but we have to be cautious. Uh, this technology needs oversight. For example, one of the areas where there totally is practical benefits of this technology is in co-piloting for software development. Like a lot of writing code is boilerplate, it's boring, right? Like it's kind of repetitive and the machines are good at doing some of that work for us. But studies have also shown that code that was generated with a co AI copilot is more likely to contain security vulnerabilities. Not because the AI is bad at writing code, but because the humans assumed it would do it right. There's an IBM uh, presentation from the 1970s uh, that you've probably seen floating around the internet, but if not, it's a great you know, paper slide from before the days of PowerPoint. It said, a machine must, ne a computer, sorry, a computer must never be allowed to make a management decision because a computer cannot be held accountable. And to echo what Tim said, my take on this era is that we have to both take, we cannot abdicate our responsibility as technologists to be a part of what's going on and to be real and authentic and grounded and ethical. We also must not permit others to use the, the sort of patina of AI to obfuscate what it is in fact they're doing. Our lives are already in many ways shaped and determined by algorithms and other things that in the past years people would call AI, but it's no longer the sort of you know, sexiest model. Um, and as people who make the internet, we all have a part to play in making sure that it's working properly, correctly for ourselves, for our families, for everyone in the world. 
Um, and so I think this is an incredibly important topic. I'm really glad that the Drupal Association brought Alex here. Um, let me welcome Alex to the stage to talk to us about why open source must win the coming AI war. Um, so all of you are open source programmers, so I assume you have some thoughts on that slide. Um, but probably 20 years ago, this was an open conversation where a little company to the north of us really wanted the whole world to believe that open source was evil. Uh, and you would see this quite often in commentaries from them. Obviously, they've changed their tune a little bit. Uh, when you go and look at who's contributing a lot of the more interesting things to open source, now it is Microsoft. How many of you people know that logo? Probably a bunch of you do. That's Hugging Face. Okay. Hugging Face, the name is phenomenal. Uh, it actually started out of open source, out of a, essentially a collection of AI models and data that organically formed on the internet. Um, and it became or is becoming the equivalent of GitHub for AI. Uh, transpose the word AI for open source, and you really have a very similar question to one that we addressed 20, 30, 40 years ago when Linux was rising. Um, so I want to use that as framing for the conversation today. The reason why open source AI is evil, too dangerous. Cannot trust the people with open source AI, it must be regulated. Now granted, every technology should be subject to some regulation and some laws, um, but right now there is a bit of a battle going on over how much regulation there's going to be and what kind of regulation, and who that regulation will actually benefit, people or companies. Ironically, the folks at Meta think that AI should be very open. Now, they do have an economic argument here. They're not gonna make money selling AI, they're gonna make money selling your attention. Um, but they are now releasing some of the more interesting open source models in AI. So what's at stake? The future of technology. That's probably a bit of an overstatement. Josh is right, we are in a hype cycle, make no mistake. That being said, AI is definitely going to change the way we do a lot of things in technology going forward, starting out with things like co-piloting software development. Um, but as you look around, you're going to see AI creep into almost every other area that you can imagine, and it already is. Today I'm talking about why open source AI must win. Um, I feel very strongly about this. I've been in open source for quite a while. I've worked with the Linux Foundation. I worked in, I ran product marketing at a company called Joyent back when we were the primary sponsors of Node.js. Um, and if you look around the world and you think about what open source does, obviously it's incredibly important and becoming more so as technology becomes more embedded in all of our lives. So this is me, my books. Um, they're all about technology, transformation, uh, some of them were about AI eight or nine years ago, and some of the things we thought were right are, are were going to happen did happen. Some things did not happen. Um, but that book, The Driver and the Driverless Car, is actually all about what Tim was talking about, that we really need to become aware of these big technology shifts and make choices as a society ourselves, or else the choices will be made for us. And we saw that with our personal data and the Internet how that played out very quickly before we even realized that all of our data was being sucked up and being used to sell ads and to grab our attention. AI, there's a similar risk, and we, for similar reasons we need to be aware, and because you folks are building the internet, you will influence a lot of these decisions going forward too. Um, little known fact, I actually built this with Drupal, so in an early job, uh, I ripped out a proprietary community software module from a company called Lithium, which I think is probably now long gone, um, and replaced it with the Drupal knowledge base and a Drupal community module. Um, it was really awesome because we loved being able to tell our community, who was largely scientists, that, hey, we are an open source platform. And it meant something to them. For people in science in particular, Having open access to data, having open access to information, to code, is critically important to innovation. So I'm going to pause, let you look at the XKCD cartoon, which is, of course, always awesome. 
and very true. Um, emblematic of the hype cycle Josh was talking about. Right now, too many companies that are talking about AI either are not really understanding what they're doing in AI or are essentially not being able to see how the AI they are building actually works under the covers. Um, this is a little bit terrifying, but it's really good context for a lot of the other conversations that you see happening out there. Anytime you see an article about hallucination or an article about an AI doing something unexpected, that's probably because it is not actually like normal programming. They do not know how it works yet, and they still don't know, and they probably won't know for another three, four, five years. So the agenda for today, how AI works, quick tour of open source AI, benefits of open AI, risks of closed AI. I'm gonna to try to move pretty quickly. Um, I, this is actually the first time I've given this talk. I've been thinking about it for a long time. You'll have to forgive me, I'm very conversational. I don't like prepared remarks, I don't like to do things off of script. So uh, there may be a few ums and ands and I may jump around a little bit, but hopefully this will be useful. So why is AI so important right now in the technology community? Clearly the people have voted. So that's a curve of GitHub repos related to AI, AI tools, data sets, et cetera, obviously off the charts. So you can see right off the bat that developers think AI is important, and if developers think AI is important, it probably means the technology around AI is important. In a nutshell, how does AI work? Probably most of you have some idea. This is a dumbed down version. How many of you have actually studied AI, studied machine learning, looked a little bit at how it worked? Anybody out here, a few of you? Yeah. So this is a really simple version that actually was probably more applicable three to five months ago. These days, there's lots of different ways they're training AI, but in its simplest form, essentially what you do when you train AI is you pull a bunch of data that is labeled that you know what it is, you push it into a model, then you slowly obfuscate pieces of the data and keep asking the system, what is this, what is this, what is this, until you feel confident that the model even when data is hard for it to understand, it can make a good prediction. Because all of AI is essentially predictions. None of it is actually anything beyond a glorified prediction machine. It doesn't have a soul, it doesn't have knowledge, it doesn't know truth, it just predicts what should come next. And so when you feel the system is confident enough that it can do that, then you test it. Now see, if you notice, you, actually you couldn't see, but that lemon under the test, one of the most important things about AI, and this is an important question to probably ask, when you get to the stage that you're actually starting to use systems, is the data that you test the system on cannot be the data that you train the system on. Um, because otherwise, it will of course recognize the data. Um, and, and that's something to keep thinking through because a lot of the times, what we're seeing being built with AI is cutting corners. For example, with some of the systems around Copilot and some of the other uh, you know, pair coding systems, they are training the security data sets on the same data sets that they use to train the coding suggestions, which is violation of separation of concerns. Not a good idea. Um, ultimately, when the AI works, it gives you a prediction. It says, okay, this is a lemon, 95% confidence. This is with visual things. It works across all realms that can be reduced to data. In fact, if you wanna learn more about how this works from an economics and business sense, um, I recommend this book, it's called Prediction Machines, it's by some folks at the University of Toronto. It's a really, really good primer on how to think about the way AI works in business or in, in, as more of an economic model. And re in reality, what we're seeing with AI is it is making something that used to be very expensive, predictions, we call it sometimes cognition, but predictions, cheap. It makes it very, very cheap. And we know from experience when we make technology that used to be expensive cheap, interesting things start to happen. So for example, cost per billion pairs of DNA sequencing. You can see that chart, obviously straight down and to the right. Okay. Um, what's happening there? Obviously, technology has made it much, much cheaper to sequence DNA. As a result, you now see companies like 23andMe you see everybody getting DNA testing that wants to get it tested. It becomes essentially a cup of coffee where it used to be like launching a rocket. Speaking of rockets, number of objects launched into space. Okay, about a decade ago, it cost $52,000 per kilo to launch a payload into space. 
Now it's down to about 2,700 bucks. Largely that's driven by SpaceX, but also a lot of other innovation in the area. Um, and what's happening is essentially the rockets and all the technology used for launch is riding a bunch of technology curves around declines in sensor costs, declines in computing, uh, improved programming, ability to do 3D printing for precision parts. All of that is combining to make space, something that used to be really expensive, a lot cheaper. And now that's why you see services like Starlink, which wouldn't have been possible at $52,000 a kilo. We're seeing similar things in AI, except here the foundation is GPUs and how much compute each GPU can have. Um, so you all know probably Moore's Law. How many of you have heard of Moore's Law? I assume most of you. So the new law is Wang's Law, named after Jensen Wang of NVIDIA, the CEO. Uh, it's not the same as Moore's Law, to be honest, but he basically says Moore's Law is like um, the same thing for GPUs, except it's faster with GPUs. Forgive me, I hiccuped on that one. Uh, he thinks the GPU's number of flops per, essentially per square chip, is going to increase even faster, and that's what's driving AI. And he's been right for a while. Uh, the, the fact that GPUs are getting more and more and more powerful is a big chunk of why AI has really gone on steroids and has just developed so quickly. So if you look at the three factors behind AI's Big Bang, uh, meaning what you experienced with ChatGPT, what's been going on really over the past two years, it's GPUs, which have gotten a whole lot more powerful and a whole lot more useful. It's algorithms, which have gotten a lot better. Now, these are not necessarily novel concepts. We've had neural nets since the 1950s. But the concepts of being able to do something like uh, things they're doing with the GPTs, with the general, general pre-trained transformers, that really started coming around maybe, fifth, maybe five, 10 years ago with teams at Google. And that's what allowed us to do things like ChatGPT where we could train massive amounts of neural networks in parallel. Um, and lastly, the increase of labeled good data, meaning data that a computer can understand uh, because we had tons of data before. But for computers to be able to really learn effectively in very large neural nets, they need massive amounts of data. Uh, and in the past, we did not have tons of good, massively, tons of good labeled data. And we have that now um, from lots of different sources. We have it from uh, ImageNet, where we literally trained, uh, uh, we used a bunch of people on Mechanical Turk to label images. We have Google Maps for driving data. We have the web, of course. All this is structured data, and so all of it can be used to train machines. And you actually see that when you look at model training and the amount of data that was being used to train models over time. Um, what this has led to is a very rapid improvement in AI capabilities. Um, something that you've noticed remarkably over the past three years because it's really spiked. Uh, but this has been going on for a bit of time and it's all driven by the fact that we have a whole lot more data and a whole lot more compute. It's really that simple. The real world effects are things like this. So if you think of that timeline, it's pretty remarkable. Really over nine years, we went from a pretty crude face designed with technology to be able to design things in mid-journey that are really beautiful and amazing and increasingly hard to be able to distinguish from other things. Now that image actually in the bottom is only from 2022. Of course, it's gotten a whole lot better since then um, and a whole lot more sophisticated to the point where you really can't tell what's real and what's AI anymore. The better systems are so good that it will fool you. And this is actually a really cool website where you can go to it and it'll put up two images and ask you to guess which is human and which is AI. Uh, and I've played with it a bunch of times and I'm actually wrong probably 30% of the time. Um, which is kind of scary if you think that the way humans were originally designed, our initial, our first level of biometrics is what? Facial recognition. It was a critical thing for us being able to recognize friend or foe. And where this is leading in the creative field, like Tim was talking about, so this is actually a clip from, a clip, an image from the first full-length music video generated with Sora, uh, which is Open, uh, OpenAI's new video model. This news actually came out, I think, a couple days ago, maybe a week max. Um, now, important caveat, uh, we do see lots and lots of these things coming out with breakthroughs, and then we learn after the fact that there was a human behind the scenes guiding the robot. Uh, you know, there may have been some editing 
on the, on the video post for, in, in post to make it look perfect. So it's really unclear how much AI can do. So don't buy into the hype that AI is going to replace everyone's job and it's going to do everything really well, really quickly. It's not true. That being said, it's pretty clear that they use this for a lot of the video and that's quite a breakthrough. Outside of creative fields, another area where AI is getting better very quickly, medicine. Um, this is a real benchmark on asking medical questions of AI systems. It is steadily getting better. We are seeing AI creeping into quote unquote decision support systems in most medical disciplines now. In the not so distant future, doctors will not know what to do without it. Uh, you are starting to see more really interesting products hit the market as well. Uh, for example, at CES this year, there was actually an AI enabled stethoscope that could identify many of the same heart patterns that you would see it, with atrial fibrillation, but you would need an echocardiogram, a much bigger machine with a specialist to do it normally. Now a normal person or a doctor can do this, these kinds of tests and detect signs of a heart attack very quickly and easily um, out in the field anywhere with just a simple stethoscope. And that's an AI algorithm. Um, a specific example in California that's pretty incredible. Uh, how many of you are familiar with, with the, the wildfire uh, camera network that's there? You may read a little bit about it, yeah. Um, so this is a program out of UC San Diego, also with CAL FIRE. Um, they have uh, panoramic cameras on hundreds of towers around the state of California uh, in all kinds of remote locations. And they are pouring them into essentially a machine vision system that identifies likely hot spots, which then humans can go and check out to make sure that it's a fire or it's not a fire. Uh, and this is a perfect use case for AI that makes a lot of sense because it's impossible for all the humans to monitor all the towers all the time, but the AI can say, oh, this looks interesting, and then the human can come in and determine yes or no, this is a fire that we need to go look at. Um, believe it or not, fires are actually harder to identify than you might think. Things like dust, fog, uh, all or bright lights, they can all really confuse things. Um, in this case, they are already seeing roughly um, 30 minute improvement in identification of hotspots than they saw in the past. Often they're beating 911 calls. So in California, literally this is probably saving lives and may have saved lives this last year. Um, we mentioned coders using AI. So this is an actual example from the a Web 2.0 conference. Uh, the CEO of GitHub was bold enough to get on stage using Copilot and build a snake game in 18 minutes live. Um, not a lot of coders would wanna do that I think in the past it would have been absolutely out of your mind, batshit crazy. But he was willing to do it without a net, and that's pretty cool. So not surprisingly, he thinks that most code is gonna be written by AI, or at least a lot of it. Um, and I think he's probably right. I think that we are starting to see many, many developers are using it in ways that are obvious, they make a lot of sense, um, and yet, at the same time, GitHub says it's faster and better. Uh, so they will tell you that code that's written with AI tends to be more accurate, that people who use AI are more likely to complete the jobs. Obviously, they're selling a product. I'm not saying they're wrong. Um, Josh's point about code security is also spot on. That's what's called a hands off the wheel problem. And it's a real problem because humans, when they think they don't have to pay attention anymore, then that's often, and they trust the machines, that's when the mistakes start to come through. Um, and so those are the two sides that you have to keep in mind as we start to look at open source AI and other kinds of AI, because on the one hand, it's really cool that Copilot uses GPT-4, it uses cutting edge technology, it's great. Um, on the other hand, wouldn't you want to know the exact training base of this code that you, of the AI that you're using to get code suggestions from, or even worse, code security suggestions from. Because if you don't know what it's trained on, how can you know what's actually in there and whether it's good or not? Let me check time. Okay, yeah, I think we're in pretty good shape. Um, a big question, what is open source AI? It's actually one that's not so easy to answer. Uh, because with open source software, it's pretty simple. The code is open. You can Copy it, do what you want with it. Uh, in AI, code is only a small piece of what's actually happening to make the system work. Another thing that's really important is the data. 
what data it was trained on, is it open data? Another is actually what they call the weights. So was, how, how are the different pieces of data weighted? So for example, when you use ChatGPT, when you use GPT-4, um, OpenAI has overly weighted more reliable data, things like Wikimedia, uh, things like the New York Times, uh, and has put less reliability on less reliable pieces of data from the public internet. Um, so that weighting is really important in understanding what the outcome is that you get. Um, also, there's licensing issues. So licensing code of AI is pretty simple, but licensing data gets more complicated. Sometimes companies don't want you to license the weights. So there's a lot of controversy right now over what is open source AI. In fact, a lot of people just prefer to call it open AI. But let's take a quick tour of that. Oh, by the way, I'm not sure if, I, if you got a chance to read it. I'll pause for a second. Um, what's on that slide is what OSI is saying they think open source AI should be. Um, OSI meaning the open source initiative. Um, there isn't an official open source AI license yet. It's a work in progress. So quick tour. Slide is totally true, by the way, even more so in AI. Um, and we are already starting to see supply chain issues in AI, just like we see in open source. Um, what are the elements of open AI, op open source AI? Open data, that's the first thing to talk about is, is the data public, can anyone use it? Is it licensed under something like Creative Commons? Or is it proprietary? Is it, was it lifted without permission? Uh, you know, where does the data come from? Open data tuning. So rarely can you just take data sets and jam them through an AI model. You actually have to tune them in advance to make sure that they do what you want them to do. So that's another thing that you actually ideally would have a company reveal, how they're tuning a model. Open weights. So that's the weighting that I talked about, where how much weight you put on deep, different types of data and different pieces of information. Um, because the weights are really critical in the outcome that you get. Tuning an AI the wrong way, so for example, if you tune it all on uh, you know, the Guardian newspaper and, and none of it on, I don't know, uh, the Wall Street Journal, you will probably get a different, out, a different response to political questions than you might otherwise. Uh, and I'm not saying that's right or wrong, I'm saying it has a real impact on the outputs. Uh, open checkpoints, so this is also another piece where as they're training a model, they use something called checkpoints where they'll sort of periodically stop and say, how is it working at this point? And when they look at it, then they'll go and tune it a little bit. They need, they, the, the more open models will actually release their checkpoints so you can literally trace back what they did and essentially rebuild it. Uh, and the last piece is open compute stack. Um, this is, what is the software that you're using to train the model? What's underneath? PyTorch, what are the pieces for computing? Um, we'll talk a little bit about something called CUDA, which is a key piece of how a lot of AI is programmed right now. Um, and so all of these pieces are elements of open source AI. And when you look at a map of who's releasing open source AI, um, or open source models, uh, it's a, a bit of a usual suspect. Um, but there's a lot of nuance as well, and some things that are kind of confusing there. So for example, Meta is often lauded for reducing what are called open source AI models, and they're open, but they sometimes don't release the data. They've done that more recently. They release it with a re license that's somewhat restrictive. If you have over 700 million users on a service, you're not allowed to use it for commercial purposes, and there's a few other elements to it. Um, and they don't necessarily release all of the information on how they tuned the model. Um, so it's kind of a semi-open model. Um, and there's really a spectrum of open, whereas with software code, there's kind of closed and open, and maybe there's source available, but it's not as nuanced. Uh, with open source AI, it's much more nuanced. Now fortunately, the AI software stack is already largely open source. Uh, this is the landscape from the Linux Foundation's uh, AI and Data Foundation. And you can see all of these tools, most of the major tools now being used to train and build AI are open source um, in some form or another. A lot of them are built by places like IBM, Google, Meta. Um, there is one really notable exception. Oh, there's more than one. There's lots of closed source AI, but in general, the, the stack is, is open source. The glaring exception is NVIDIA's CUDA. Um, so CUDA is the right now the easiest way for developers to uh, 
take compute jobs that they want to run and feed it into an AI system and have it run effectively on NVIDIA GPUs. Um, now why does this matter? Because what makes programming for AI more challenging is you have to modify the way you code so that it will run parallel processes. CUDA takes care of a lot of that for you automatically and makes it simple. Um, this is a big chunk of why NVIDIA is ahead um, and because it is much easier to use and design things for NVIDIA software, NVIDIA GPUs. Uh, as a result, um, there's a big effort to build open source that can replace CUDA, although it's very challenging because uh, NVIDIA is really far ahead and everybody's used to using CUDA and if you aren't using CUDA to run NVIDIA GPUs, you're way behind. But fortunately, in the not so distant future, training models will be important, but not as important as training data. So we're already seeing a war for who will control, who will control all the world's relevant training data. Um, and some of it is open source already. Uh, you, know, you have different providers of really amazing amounts of data out there. Uh, the Common Crawl, for example, is a fabulous web crawl data set. Uh, the Allen Institute of AI has amazing data sets around biology and language. Um, but you also see things like OpenAI uh, and other companies are quickly trying to license sources of data that they can use to train their AI. And it's unclear whether this data will give them an unfair advantage. Um, and that's a reason, as a community, you want to push for open data when you're using AI products, if at all possible. And probably in the future, you might be asked to participate in efforts to create more open AI data systems. Now, as I said, there are lots of open AI systems, lots of open source training data systems, um, uh, open source training data sets. Uh, this is a, a page of Hugging Face. There are currently hundreds of thousands of open source training sets. So you can go and train on lots of different data that is open source that has been uh, vetted and is really good. You don't necessarily need to go and try to license data from other places um, for most of what you're trying to do. Now, if you're trying to build found foundational models that are on the frontier, like OpenAI, then you want the highest quality data and you want data that's constantly changing to reflect the world. So that's why they're going to do things like license Financial Times data. So what are the benefits of open source AI? I'm going to let you quickly read a few of these arguments. And this is actually generated by Google Gemini. Um, it, it's a really good use case is using as a starting point for research or learning about things. Probably a lot of you have used it that way. Um, I never use it verbatim for anything because it often does hallucinate. But that being said, you can see there's some pretty good reasons for why uh, Gemini thinks open source AI is important. I personally agree with all of them, and the reason I put that up there verbatim is because I actually thought, eh, this is pretty good. It summarizes it quite nicely. Um, but on top of that, we can also just learn from history a little bit. So if you think about these two software projects, Kubernetes and Linux, two of the more successful software projects ever, hands down. Um, and you think about the community that has grown up around them, and Drupal would be another example here too, of course. Uh, you see these communities with tremendous staying power and huge ecosystems that support thousands of businesses and at the same time create communities and thousands and thousands of jobs that are really good for people. Uh, and so I think that when we look at history, we can see that history repeats itself or history rhymes and so when we've really let open source communities develop well, good things have happened. I think that's a, a really good guide just to start with. You know, another really important reason is training foundational models is insanely expensive because you need a lot of GPUs and you need a lot of data. And you can see this chart. This looks at the training model cost, the model training cost for most of the recent systems. And on you know on on the end there is Google Gemini, which was an insane amount of money. I mean, you can think like, yes, Google can handle it because it's not that much for them. Um, but this is actually a great reason why we really want the open source community to be able to potentially pitch in together and do something like this, maybe with a neutral party like it could be Linux Foundation, it could be Hugging Face. Uh, but it's really important that building foundational models that cost so much to train becomes a community property 
because otherwise the models are owned by for-profit companies that have a very specific goal of what they want to do. And I'm not saying for-profit is bad in open source, it's not. You, everyone needs to make money, but when you control a very scarce resource like that, then it's very dangerous. And that's the same reason why what Meta is doing is so important. So we mentioned the economic model of open source. Um, this is the fundraising that the Cloud Native Computing Foundation has recorded for its members over the past five years, roughly. Um, and you can look at it, it's astounding. I mean, $160 billion. Um, if you think about the economics of software development these days, there are very few companies that say, we're building proprietary products because nobody wants to back them as VCs. So it's a proven economic model. It will attract funding, uh, particularly if it's in a neutral community managed by a foundation that's effective. So we're already seeing the next piece, which is that more open source AI generates more open source AI. Uh, same thing we see with Linux, the same, same, same thing we see with CNCF. As, we, as the community grows, as the community becomes more successful, more people are willing to contribute and it has a fabulous flywheel effect. And with Starshot, that might be something that you would see there too, where as you start to build new things with Drupal, then you will get more people that want to contribute and you'll see more interesting developments, more interesting capabilities, et cetera. So in open source, this is something that naturally happens as people like to use what they're doing because they will solve problems with open source or they'll build things to solve their problems, right? You don't see that as much in proprietary. Nobody says, I'm gonna build Oracle a module to fix this because I really have this problem. It doesn't work that way. Um, I mentioned open source begets, or open AI begets more open AI. So when you're looking at foundational models, you can see that the majority of them now are actually open. Um, the ones being created recently. Um, and th this is, there's a wide range when you say foundational models. Uh, and there's even floating definitions around that. The White House tried to give it a definition of a model that requires a certain amount of teraflops for training. I don't know if that'll hold over time because we're getting much more efficient at training models. But in general, you get the idea that if we see something like Llama come out, you'll start to see even more open AI. Innovation sparked by open source AI. So some of you probably read about Llama 3. I'll let you read this tweet. Six hundred models in a short span of time. Six hundred. So that gives you just a little bit of an idea of what happens, how much demand there is for AI right now, for good AI, because Llama 3 is apparently quite powerful, even though they haven't released. Oops, did my mic? Okay, there it is. Um, it's inc incredibly powerful and works really well. So well that people are going to want to build on it quickly. Now, this is something that's actually really interesting with open source AI. Um, it's not like open source software in that building on top of it or building something entirely new on top of it requires a massive amount of effort. Uh, you can actually take a foundational model and augment it in lots of different ways and very quickly turn it into something that's a bit better and distinct. So it, it follows the same uh, model of open source of improving and building on the last thing, but it really lets you do it at a lot faster pace. And that's really interesting as you go forward because it means you will be able to do iterative things with open source AI that you would never be able to do with closed source AI. And if AI is really closed source, then people will be left behind who do not have the money to pay for the closed source AI. How many of you read this story in the Times or read about it somewhere? Yeah. Um, so this was really, um, it, I mean, it is a more nuanced issue than you read on the slide or read in the newspaper because what OpenAI argued was they said the New York Times uh, hired some developers to figure out a way to create prompts that would generate verbatim stories out of, uh, out, out of its training data. Um, the New York Times' point was, hey, we didn't give you permission to train on our data. And this is, by the way, there is a, uh, you know, a, there, there, there's a TOS on our site which says don't crawl us. Um, the gray area is what we're calling fair use, and I'm sure Tim can give you an earful about that if he wants to. Um, 
But fair use in a nutshell is a, is a concept where you can take creative property of other people and if you remix it sufficiently and if you're building something that's useful for society, that's okay. Um, it is unclear with AI that that's what they're doing and even more troubling is unclear with the proprietary companies what they're actually training on. That's part of the secret sauce that they try to sell us and that's dangerous um, because you really don't know what's going into the secret sauce that you're buying. And I'll give you a specific example. Um, and in open source, there's a very large image data set called Lion, L-A-I-O-N, I forget the pronunciation. Um, recently, uh, they, the, this is open source, so p anyone could look at it. They found a number of child pornography images that have been mixed in by somebody um, you know, as, as a way to subvert the data set. Because this was open source, they could figure this out. In a proprietary data set, you can't see that. And you often don't know where the data is coming from, and they may be doing something like using Mechanical Turk to do the training. So we already have a pretty good idea that open source is more transparent. This is actually open source transparency index from Stanford AI Lab. Um, uh, if you get a chance, check out the Stanford AI index. It's a really good document to read to get a sense for the landscape of AI. Um, and you can see Meta's at the top, Amazon's at the bottom, not surprising. Amazon's a great company, but they're not necessarily so good at sharing the inner workings of what they do. Um, and you can look by domain as well. So these are two charts from there. But the bottom line, even the best open AI right now, the best open source AI, still has some ways to go in terms of really becoming truly open. And again, why is this so important? Linus's law, transparency equals security. So we are already seeing supply chain attacks in AI. Um, in this case, they're inserting bad data or inserting malicious instructions, malicious code into models on Hugging Face, equivalent of doing things like that on GitHub. Um, we will see more of this. Uh, because it is in the open source domain, though, we can see it, and we can detect it, and the community can help and stop it. That's not something you can do with open AI. When I say open AI, forgive me. I mean the company open AI, not the, not open AI. No, notice the conflict there. <laughs> um, but a really good way to think about this is, uh, you remember I mentioned that uh, very, the reason why they're hallucinations, the reason why so many things go wrong with AI, the reason why they can't necessarily tell you if you type in a prompt what the output's going to be is because they don't know exactly how it works. So that's essentially what this is. Because the, if there's lack of transparency and you can't pop the hood and see that there's actually a gerbil, you know, or a hamster on a hamster wheel that's powering your transmission, right? That's not a good thing if you want to take a car and drive cross country. Um, similar deal with AI. We want to be very cautious. And we want to really understand everything that's happening because transparency is absolutely essential. And transparency is anathema to proprietary AI. So let's talk a little bit more about the risks of closed AI. And this will be um, uh, a, a, little, a little more focused on uh, some of the negative impacts rather than uh, at the software level. Um, so first, I just wanted to look at why people say open source AI is so dangerous. And you can generally summarize it into uh, you know, three things. Um, one is bad actors can get to it really easily, true. Same with open source software. We remember we had similar conversations about cryptography and cryptographic libraries maybe a decade ago. Um, and we had similar discussions with government regulation. They actually banned uh, a lot of the cryptographic libraries for export. Um, didn't work very well. Uh, so similar deal. Lack of oversight. Um, I personally am not a big fan of tremendous oversight of open source development of anything because I think that Oversight generally ends up in regulatory capture, um, and that you want people to be able to take their grievance to the court if they need to, but you don't want to create government bodies to regulate every new thing. That's my personal view. Um, and then accelerated development of dangerous capabilities, so things like bioweapons, uh, you know, things that, nuclear weapons, and we haven't seen much of that to date. 
even though you think that with the current models it would be good. And frankly, what a lot of the people who, point, who would look at this say is, well, actually, if you want to go on the internet and access a recipe for a bomb, you can do that on Google. You don't need ChatGPT to do that for you. So it's unclear whether that's just another argument about AI being, making it sound like it's more intelligent than it actually is. Um, Now clearly, big players want AI regulation. We talked about that with, um, with uh, Sam Altman. That has actually started to swing, interestingly, over the past four or five months, where initially Google came out very strongly in favor of AI regulation. That seems to be wavering now, um, because they are starting to recognize, after watching what Meta did, that having a really strong open source product in AI might be very beneficial to them. Um, particularly if they don't feel that they're competing directly with it, uh, which I think over time they'll recognize they're not. Um, you know, it's not like someone's going to go and build an AI search engine and immediately launch and compete with Google. People are trying. Perplexity is doing okay. A lot of hype. But nothing, if you go look at traffic, it's pretty clear that Google is still doing very well. Microsoft has always kind of played on the fence. Um, you know, they release a lot of really good open source models themselves. Um, and they also, are, of course, are the major funders and own a lot of OpenAI's shares. Um, but in general, if you look at it, the biggest folks are the ones that want AI regulation, uh, with the exception of Meta, whereas smaller folks and people in open source do not want AI regulation for the same reason that they don't want open source software regulation. Uh, clearly, AI is on the regulatory radar. So this is a chart of regulatory mentions. Uh, we also have seen a lot more laws pop up. Um, where we're, we're like the EU AI Act that are legislating AI, and they've been pretty careful to carve out open source, but even there, it's, it's not tested yet. We don't know what it's going to do, particularly if companies like Mistral are building foundational models that are open source, and they have to go and get compliance. Um, because compliance equals money, and compliance means that people with a lot of lobbying dollars can probably write the rules. And we already saw that to a certain degree uh, with, with telecommunications and with the internet. And so this is why a lot of open source advocates are asking, will regulation lock out competition? So a law in California is fast-tracked that will actually create an AI regulatory body called the Frontier Model Division, forgive me, um, where you will have to submit your Frontier model to them every year and testify as a developer, under penalty of perjury, that this model is safe, what could possibly go wrong? Um, of course, people reacted very strongly when you hear that you could be called a perjurer for developing software, um, particularly when even folks like OpenAI can't build systems without hallucinations. Uh, but the state of California thinks that this is a, a good idea. Chances are it'll start to fall, it'll change and be something in the middle. Again, I don't want to make it sound like we want zero regulation in, in open source uh, or AI. But you have to understand that uh, a small open source project is far more likely to suffer if there are strict regulations than a very large company with armies of lawyers and people that can go to bat for their developers. Um, problems with the current approach of AI. So they're now starting to see some indications that even though you will hear from a lot of people that AI is getting better and better and better and better, that it's actually not. Um, Meta's chief of AI has started calling LLMs, large language models, a dead end. Okay, meaning, really cool, not going to get to what a no AGI. We're not going to see AGI anytime soon. And in fact, when you look at the ways, the performance levels on various benchmarks of a lot of AI systems, it, they're flatlining. They're plateauing at or above, just above human capabilities. So the question there is, so if we are already facing a situation where we're seeing some plateauing and we've seen the large, large players bet on one kind of technology largely, which is LLMs, what if they bet on the wrong horse? This is funding for AI. Um, and most of it is going into generative AI. Sorry, this is funding for generative AI. So LLMs, you see that giant spike, um, a massive amount of venture capital. What that means is that people are not exploring other types of AI. Um, and the main body of funding for that generative AI is going into models that are not open yet. Okay. 
And so when you look at Hugging Face, which is all open source pretty much, there are 600,000 models on there. Wouldn't it be better to let the open source crowd, all of you, bet on what the next AI should be rather than a handful of developers with a whole lot of money from venture capital? Similarly, we're seeing private industry rapidly make inroads in AI. Granted, this was going to happen because it is a neat technology. Okay, it's really important. Um, but as a result, PhDs coming out of universities, rather than doing cutting edge research or things that might forward open source more, more and more are going into private industry. Now granted, a lot of private industry is still doing open source. Um, but the fact that AI right now is skewing so heavily towards industry um, really means that we need more and more emphasis on open source so that industry doesn't bias towards proprietary. Um, and this is one that really irritates me quite a bit. Um, and this, this does sort of fall into a bit of the regulation side. You can go ahead and take a look at that. Um, am, is that a terrible thing I'm asking? I mean, I'm trying to create a small, funny cartoon, uh, you know, and it tells me, no, you can't do this. Um, in open source, if someone tells you, no, you can't do that, you can take a look at the data, you can choose a different model, you can fork it, you can go and do it. Now, granted, there's lots of really awful use cases that they're trying to prevent for here. I know, violent pictures, things like that. But um, there's a lot of power when you give the capability to innovate to the community and let them decide what they can do. Um, so you want to make sure that as you're regulating against all of these other things, that you're not also regulating out creativity. Straight up question. Is this why you comment on Reddit so that OpenAI can buy your data? Um, the risk that anything you post publicly will get sucked into AI and be paid for for training someone's proprietary data set. Um, I mean, granted, it's going to happen no matter what, but why not have Reddit um, you know, contribute its data to the open source community as well? Because God knows you all gave it to them for free. Um, bias from bias data. Um, so when the systems aren't transparent, things like this happen. Uh, this is actually a reporter who asked this very good question. An Asian reporter asked the system to create a business headshot for her, and it did. It made her more white, and it gave her blue eyes because it was trained on data of white-eyed, of white, blue-eyed women. So it did not under, it could not associate the idea of an Asian woman with a professional headshot. Um, now this is just image generation, but this demonstrates the risk of when we have these closed systems and you can't actually see what data was trained on and where the biases are. Um, Tim mentioned how can creators be compensated. Uh, so this is actually from a substack by a very smart guy named Gary Marcus, who's an AI expert. Um, and he typed in a simple prompt. Sounds a lot like certain creatures you might know somewhere, but at the same time he didn't say minions, right? And so what did he get back out? A minion. Something that you would probably get sued for if you put that on your website. Right? Um, the systems are really good at interpreting data, in, in interpreting, uh, say if, if you went to ask for like Italian plumber from a video game, it would give you Mario, okay? <laughs> Doesn't mean it gives you the copyright to Mario. Um, but it's really hard to build a mid-journey that will understand, oh, they're asking for a copyright image, I have to create something that doesn't look like Mario when it's only been trained on Mario. AI is often authoritatively wrong. So this was actually an article um, about math assignments in ChatGPT. Um, so it, I wouldn't say it's wrong most of the time, but it's wrong often enough. And again, uh, you know, we, we talked about earlier with the sort of the coding problems, um, that if you believe it's right, then you are more likely to miss the mistakes. We still believe, put too much belief in AI. And unless we can move towards more open source AI, uh, we're not going to be able to understand when it's wrong and when it's right. Now, granted, there will be certain things where it will recognize, but for example, in code, it can be really, really hard to understand when it's generated something that actually doesn't work unless you look at it very closely. Uh, granted, you'll have to run unit tests, but there is, anyway, it's, I, I, I did, I, that one I shouldn't go too far down on, but, uh, <laughs> um, but I am familiar with, like, for example, when you uh, invoke certain classes or things like that, you won't necessarily catch it in a unit test. Um, but it, it, it can be wrong. 
And I've seen a lot of examples of this. Um, so the last one that I will bring up that I think is a big risk is we've been talking a lot about traceability. This one really hammers it home because this is a real example of one of the largest health insurers in the US uh, that decided it wanted to outsource uh, decision making on key medical decisions to an AI system and have the doctors basically rubber stamp it. Um, and so it was making decisions in 1.2 seconds or so uh, on life or death things for people. This, you might call this an algorithm, it's predictive, uh, but it, it is a, a, in essence a form of AI. Um, and then some of the doctors who were actually running the system noticed it was making really bad mistakes um, and denying people care that didn't deserve to have that, that should have gotten that care. Um, and the problem there is there's no recourse, right? What are you going to say to the insurance company? You're gonna say, I deserve this. And it's gonna say, well, our system said you don't. Um, so unless we have these systems that can be really traceable and transparent, we put ourselves at risk as we put more and more critical decision making on those systems. So what can you do? Um, these are just four, ba five basic steps, right? Um, it, there will be more as you go along, but simple things to ask. If you're using an AI system, ask, what's the models that, it's, that, it, that, that underlie this service? Because uh, you you're building web applications, you will pull in services that will be, some of you probably are, I'm assuming, uh, you know, for risk management, payments, all kinds of things. Asking what is this trained on? Because increasingly you'll be able to opt for systems that are trained on open source data and are using open source models. Um, ask about the licenses of the system. So for example, there's open and there's open source. Uh, you may want to choose, like if it's built on top of Meta, you may not like the idea that even though Meta's relatively, or Llama, even though it's relatively open source, it's something that will still require, you still cannot necessarily uh, you know, go and reproduce all the things that you would as a normal open source. You might opt for something much more open source. Um, are the models trained on ethically sourced, ethically sourced data? You know, where did the data come from? Did it, was it scraped? Was it used by, or was it created by a bunch of people on a content farm somewhere in Africa working on Mechanical Turk? Um, how the data was generated is really important. CDP systems are great because then you know exactly the provenance of the data, but as you're bringing AI services in, you won't necessarily know that, you will need to ask. Um, are there better, more ethical data sources that can be used? So if we nudge the world towards using better data sources, towards more ethical data sources, then we will likely be able to get more of those data sources because people will listen and companies will listen. Um, and how easy is it, would it be for one of these companies to switch from a closed model to an open model? Because if you don't ask, you're never gonna know, right? A lot of them, probably that's something they may have deployed open AI because the API is easiest, and they may decide, oh, over time we'd actually rather try something else, or maybe they're in the middle of a decision process. But because you're building web apps, and you will be the buyers, ask the question and see what happens. Um, Thank you very much. I think, let me check with Tim. I think we have time for, uh, did we have time for any questions or? I think, no, oh, we're done, sorry, okay. I'm, so I overran my time, forgive me. Um, hopefully this was useful to you. Um, I really enjoyed chatting with, just sort of talking about this and thank you for bearing with me on my main run of this presentation. Um, it'll iterate over time. Really what you guys are all doing is so important and I'm really glad that you're able to listen to this and hopefully you learned something.